This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Villette by Charlotte Bronte, Chapter Thirty Nine, Old and New Acquaintance. Fascinated as by a basilisk with three heads, I could not leave this clique. The ground near them seemed to hold my feet. The canopy of entwined trees held out shadow. The night whispered a pledge of protection, and an officious lamp flashed just one beam to show me an obscure, safe seat, and then vanished. Let me now briefly tell the reader all that, during the past dark fortnight, I have been silently gathering from rumour respecting the origin and the object of Monsieur Emmanuel's departure. The tale is short and not new. Its alpha is mammon, and its omega interest. If Madame Walravens was hideous as a Hindu idol, she seemed also to possess, in the estimation of these her votaries, an idol's consequence. The fact was, she had been rich, very rich, and though for the present without the command of money, she was likely one day to be rich again. At Basseterre in Guadeloupe she possessed a large estate, received in dowry on her marriage sixty years ago, sequestered since her husband's failure, but now, it was supposed, cleared of claim, and, if duly looked after by a competent agent of integrity, considered capable of being made, in a few years, largely productive. Paris Silas took an interest in this prospective improvement for the sake of religion and the church, whereof Magliar Walravens was a devout daughter. Madame Beck, distantly related to the hunchback, and knowing her to be without family of her own, had long brooded over contingencies with a mother's calculating forethought, and harshly treated as she was by Madame Walravens, never ceased to court her for interest's sake. Madame Beck and the priest were thus, for money reasons, equally and sincerely interested in the nursing of the West Indian estate. But the distance was great, and the climate hazardous. The competent and upright agent wanted must be a devoted man. Just such a man had Madame Walravens retained for twenty years in her service, blighting his life and then living on him like an old fungus. Such a man had Parasilus trained, taught, and bound to him by the ties of gratitude, habit, and belief. Such a man Madame Beck knew, and could in some measure influence. My pupil, said Parasilus, if he remains in Europe, runs risk of apostasy, for he has become entangled with a heretic. Madame Beck made also her private comment, and preferred in her own breast her secret reason for desiring expatriation. The thing she could not obtain, she desired not another to win. Rather would she destroy it. As to Madame Walravens, she wanted her money and her land, and knew Paul, if he liked, could make the best and faithfulest steward. So the three self-seekers banded and beset the one unselfish. They reasoned, they appealed, they implored. On his mercy they cast themselves. Into his hands they confidingly thrust their interests. They asked but two or three years of devotion. After that, he should live for himself. One of the number, perhaps, wished that in the meantime he might die. No living being ever humbly laid his advantage at Monsieur Emmanuel's feet, or confidingly put it into his hands, that he spurned the trust, or repulsed the repository. What might be his private pain or inward reluctance to leave Europe, what his calculations for his own future, none asked, or knew, or reported. All this was a blank to me. His conferences with his confessor, I might guess. The part duty and religion were made to play in the persuasions used, I might conjecture. He was gone, and had made no sign. There my knowledge closed. With my head bent, and my forehead resting on my hands, I sat amidst grouped tree stems and branching brushwood. Whatever talk passed amongst my neighbors I might hear if I would. I was near enough, but for some reason there was scarce motive to attend. They gossiped about the dresses, the music, the illuminations, the fine night. I listened to hear them say, It is calm weather for his voyage. The Antigua, his ship, will sail prosperously. No such remark fell. Neither the Antigua, nor her course, nor her passenger were named. Perhaps the light chat scarcely interested old Madame Walravens more than it did me. 
she appeared restless, turning her head now to this side, now to that, looking through the trees and among the crowd, as if expectant of an arrival and impatient of delay. "'Où sont-ils? Pourquoi ne viennent-ils?' I heard her mutter more than once. And at last, as if determined to have an answer to her question, which hitherto none seemed to mind, she spoke aloud this phrase, a phrase brief enough, simple enough, but it sent a shock through me. Messieurs et madame, said she, où donc est Justine Marie? Justine Marie? What was this? Justine Marie, the dead nun? Where was she? Why, in her grave, madame Wall Ravens. What can you want with her? You shall go to her, but she shall not come to you. Thus I should have answered, had the response laid with me. But nobody seemed to be of my mind. Nobody seemed surprised, startled, or at a loss. The quietest commonplace answer met the strange, the dead disturbing, the witch of Ender query of the hunchback. Justine Marie, said one, is coming. She is in the kiosk. She will be here presently. Out of this question and reply sprang a change in the chat. Chat it still remained, easy, desultory, familiar gossip. Hint, allusion, comment went round the circle, but all so broken, so dependent on references to persons not named, or circumstances not defined, that listen as intently as I would, and I did listen now with a faded interest, I could make out no more than that some scheme was on foot, in which this ghostly Justine Marie, dead or alive, was concerned. This family junta seemed grasping at her somehow, for some reason. There seemed question of a marriage, of a fortune, for whom I could not quite make out, perhaps for Victor Kent, perhaps for Joseph Emmanuel. Both were bachelors. Once I thought the hints and jests rained upon a fair-haired foreigner of the party, whom they called Heinrich Mueller. Amidst all the badinage, Madame Walraven still obtruded from time to time hoarse, cross-grained speeches, her impatience being diverted only by an implacable surveillance of Desiree, who could not stir, but the old woman menaced her with her staff. "'La voilà!' suddenly cried one of the gentlemen. "'Voilà Justine Marie qui arrive!' This moment was for me peculiar. I called to memory the pictured nun on the panel. Present to my mind was the sad love story. I saw and thought the vision of the garret, the apparition of the alley, the strange birth of the berceau. I underwent a presentiment of discovery, a strong conviction of coming disclosure. Ah, when imagination once runs riot, where do we stop? What winter tree so bare and branchless, what wayside hedge-munching animal so humble that fancy, a passing cloud, and a struggling moonbeam, will not clothe it in spirituality? and make of it a phantom. With solemn force pressed upon my heart, the expectation of mystery breaking up. Hitherto had I seen this specter only through a glass darkly. Now was I to behold it face to face. I leaned forward. I looked. She comes, cried Joseph Emmanuel. The circle opened as if opening to admit a new and welcome member. At this instant a torch chanced to be carried past. Its blaze aided the pale moon in doing justice to the crisis, in lighting to perfection the denouement pressing on. Surely those near me must have felt some little of the anxiety I felt, in degrees so unmeted. Of that group the coolest must have held his breath for a time. As for me, my life stood still. It is over. The moment and the nun are come. The crisis and the revelation are passed by. The flambeau glares within a yard, held up in a park-keeper's hand. It, its long, eager tongue of flame almost licks the figure of the expected. There, where she stands full in my sight. What is she like? What does she wear? How does she look? Who is she? There are many masks in the park tonight, and as the hour wears late, so strange a feeling of revelry and mystery begins to spread abroad that scarce would you discredit me, reader, were I to say that she is like the nun of the attic, that she wears black skirts and white head clothes, that she looks the resurrection of the flesh, and that she is a risen ghost. All falsities, all figments. We will not deal in this gear. Let us be honest and cut, as heretofore, from the homely web of truth. 
Homely, though, is an ill-chosen word. What I see is not precisely homely. A girl of Villette stands there, a girl fresh from her pensionnat. She is very comely, with the beauty indigenous to this country. She looks well-nourished, fair, and fat of flesh. Her cheeks are round, her eyes good, her hair abundant. She is handsomely dressed. She is not alone. Her escort consists of three persons, two being elderly. These she addresses as mon oncle et ma tante. She laughs, she chats, good-humoured, buxom and blooming. She looks at all points the bourgeois belle. So much for Justine Marie. So much for ghosts and mysteries. Not that this last was solved. This girl certainly is not my nun. What I saw in the garret in the garden must have been taller by a span. We have looked at the city bell. We have cursorily glanced at the respectable old uncle and aunt. Have we a stray glance to give to the third member of this company? Can we spare him a moment's notice? We ought to distinguish him so far, reader. He has claims on us. We do not now meet him for the first time. I clasped my hands very hard, and I drew my breath very deep. I held in the cry. I devoured the ejaculation. I forbade the start. I spoke, and I stirred, no more than a stone. But I knew what I looked on. Through the dimness left in my eyes by many nights weeping, I knew him. They said he was to sail by the Antigua. Madame Beck said so. She lied, or she had uttered what was once truth, and failed to contradict it when it became false. The Antigua was gone, and there stood Paul Emmanuel. Was I glad? A huge load left me. Was it a fact to warrant joy? I know not. Ask first what were the circumstances attendant upon this respite. How far did this delay concern me? Were there not those whom it might touch more nearly? After all, who may this young girl, this Justine Marie, be? Not a stranger, reader. She is known to me by sight. She visits at the Rue Fossette. She is often of Madame Beck's Sunday parties. She is a relation of both the Becks and the Walravens. She derives her baptismal name from the sainted nun who would have been her aunt had she lived. Her patronomic is Sauveur. She is an heiress and an orphan, and Monsieur Emmanuel is her guardian, some say her godfather. The family hunter wished this heiress to be married to one of their band. Which is it? Vital question, which is it? I felt very glad now that the drug administered in the sweet draught had filled me with a possession which made bed and chamber intolerable. I always, through my whole life, liked to penetrate to the real truth. I like seeking the goddess in her temple, and handling the veil, and daring the dread glance. O oh, titaness among deities, the covered outline of thine aspect sickens often through its uncertainty. But define to us one trait, show us one lineament, clear and awful sincerity. We may gasp in untold terror, but with that gasp we drink in a breath of thy divinity. Our heart shakes, its currents sway like rivers lifted by earthquake but we have swallowed strength. To see and know the worst is to take from fear her main advantage. The Walraven's party, augmented in numbers, now became very gay. The gentlemen fetched refreshments from the kiosk. All sat down on the turf under the trees. They drank healths and sentiments. They laughed, they jested. Monsieur Emmanuel underwent some raillery. Half good-humored, half I thought malicious, especially on Madame Beck's part. I soon gathered that his voyage had been temporarily deferred of his own will, without the concurrence, even against the advice, of his friends. He had let the Antigua go, and had taken his berth in the Paul et Virginie, appointed to sail a fortnight later. It was his reason for this resolve which they teased him to assign, and which he would only vaguely indicate as the settlement of a little piece of business which he had set his heart upon. What was this business? Nobody knew. Yes, there was one who seemed partly, at least, in his confidence. A meaning look passed between him and Justine Marie. La petite va m'aider, n'est-ce pas? said he. The answer was prompt enough, God knows. Mais oui, je vous aiderai de tout mon cœur. Vous ferez de moi tout ce que vous voudrez, mon parrain. 
and this dear Perrin took her hand and lifted it to his grateful lips. Upon which demonstration I saw the light-complexioned young Teuton, Heinrich Müller, grow restless, as if he did not like it. He even grumbled a few words, whereat Monsieur Emmanuel actually laughed in his face, and with the ruthless triumph of the assured conqueror, he drew his ward nearer to him. Monsieur Emmanuel was indeed very joyous that night. He seemed not one whit subdued by the change of scene and action impending. He was the true life of the party. A little despotic, perhaps, determined to be chief in mirth as well as in labor, yet from moment to moment proving indisputably his right of leadership. He was the wittiest word, the pleasantest anecdote, the frankest laugh. Restlessly active, after his manner, he multiplied himself to wait on all. But, oh, I saw which was his favorite. I saw at whose feet he lay on the turf. I saw whom he folded carefully from the night air, whom he tended, watched, and cherished as the apple of his eye. Still, hint and raillery flew thick, and still I gathered that while Monsieur Paul should be absent, working for others, these others, not quite ungrateful, would guard for him the treasure he left in Europe. Let him bring them an Indian fortune. They would give him in return a young bride and a rich inheritance. As for the saintly consecration, the vow of constancy, that was forgotten. The blooming and charming present prevailed over the past, and, at length, his nun was indeed buried. Thus it must be. The revelation was indeed come. Presentiment had not been mistaken in her impulse. There is a kind of presentiment which never is mistaken. It was I, who had for a moment miscalculated. Not seeing the true bearing of the oracle, I had thought she muttered a vision when, in truth, her prediction touched reality. I might have paused longer upon what I saw. I might have deliberated ere I drew inferences. Some, perhaps, would have held the premises doubtful, the proofs insufficient. Some slow skeptics would have incredulously examined, ere they conclusively accepted the project of a marriage between a poor and unselfish man of forty, and his wealthy ward of eighteen. But far from me such shifts and palliatives, far from me such temporary evasion of the actual, such coward fleeing from the dread, the swift-footed, the all-overtaking fact, such feeble suspense of submission to her, the sole sovereign, such paltering and faltering resistance to the power whose errand is to march conquering and to conquer, such traitor defection from the truth. No, I hastened to accept the whole plan. I extended my grasp and took it all in. I gathered it to me with a sort of rage of haste and folded it round me as the soldier struck on the field folds his colors about his breast. I invoked conviction to nail upon me the certainty, abhorred while embraced, to fix it with the strongest spikes her strongest strokes could drive, and when the iron had entered well my soul, I stood up as I thought, renovated. In my infatuation I said, Truth, you are a good mistress to your faithful servants. While a lie pressed me, how I suffered. Even when the falsehood was still sweet, still flattering to the fancy and warm to the feelings, it wasted me with hourly torment. The persuasion that affection was won could not be divorced from the dread that, by another turn of the wheel, it might be lost. Truth stripped away falsehood and flattery and expectancy, and here I stand free. Nothing remained now but to take my freedom to my chamber, to carry it with me to my bed, and see what I could make of it. The play was not yet indeed quite played out. I might have waited and watched longer that love scene under the trees, that sylvan courtship. Had there been nothing of love in the demonstration, my fancy in this hour was so generous, so creative, she could have modeled for it the most salient lineaments, and given it the deepest life and highest color of passion. But I would not look. I had fixed my resolve, but I would not violate my nature. And then, something tore me so cruelly under my shawl, something so dug into my side, a vulture so strong in beak and talon, I must be alone to grapple with it. I think I never felt jealousy till now. 
This was not like enduring the endearments of Dr. John and Paulina, against which, while I sealed my eyes and my ears, while I withdrew thence my thoughts, my sense of harmony still acknowledged in it a charm. This was an outrage. The love born of beauty was not mine. I had nothing in common with it. I could not dare to meddle with it. But another love, venturing diffidently into life after long acquaintance, furnace tried by pain, stamped by constancy, consolidated by affection's pure and durable alloy, submitted by intellect to intellect's own tests, and finally wrought up by his process to his own unflawed completeness, this love that laughed at passion, his fast frenzies, and his hot and hurried extinction, in this love I had a vested interest, and whatever tended either to its culture or to its destruction, I could not view impassably. I turned from the group of trees and the merry company in its shade. Midnight was long past. The concert was over. The crowds were thinning. I followed the ebb. Leaving the radiant park in well-lit Hauteville, still well-lit, this seems it was to be a nuit blanche in Villette, I sought the dim lower quarter. Dim, I should not say, for the beauty of moonlight, forgotten in the park, here once more flowed in upon perception. High she rode, and calm and stainlessly she shone. The music and the mirth of the fete, the fire and bright hues of those lamps had outdone and outshone her for an hour. But now, again, her glory and her silence triumphed. The rival lamps were dying. She held her course like a white fate. Drum, trumpet, bugle had uttered their clangor, and were forgotten. With pencil ray she wrote on heaven and on earth records for archives everlasting. She and those stars seemed to me at once the types and witnesses of truth all regnant. The night sky lit her reign. Like its slow willing progress advanced her victory, an onward movement which has been, and is, and will be, from eternity to eternity. These oil-twinkling streets are very still. I like them for their lowliness and peace. Homeward-bound burghers pass me now and then, but these companies are pedestrians, make little noise, and are soon gone. So well do I love Villette under her present aspect. Not willingly would I re-enter under a roof, but that I am bent on pursuing my strange adventure to a successful close, and quietly regaining my bed in the great dormitory before Madame Beck comes home. Only one street lies between me and the Rue Fossette. As I enter it, for the first time, the sound of a carriage tears up the deep piece of this quarter. It comes this way. It comes very fast. How loud sounds its rattle on the paved path! The street is narrow, and I keep carefully to the causeway. The carriage thunders past, but what do I see, or fancy I see, as it rushes by? Surely something white fluttered from that window. Surely a hand waved a handkerchief. Was that signal meant for me? Am I known? Who would recognize me? That is not Monsieur de Bassompierre's carriage, nor Mrs. Breton's. And besides, neither the Hôtel Crassy nor the Chateau of La Terresse lies in that direction. Well, I have no time for conjecture. I must hurry home. Gaining the Rue Fossette, reaching the pensionnat, all there was still. No fiacre had arrived with Madame and Désirée. I had left the great door ajar. Should I find it thus? Perhaps the wind or some other accident may have thrown it to with sufficient force to start the spring bolt. In that case, hopeless became admission. My adventure must issue in catastrophe. I lightly pushed the heavy leaf. Would it yield? Yes. As soundless, as unresisting, as if some propitious genius had waited on a sesame charm in the vestibule within. Entering with bated breath, quietly making all fast, shoelessly mounting the staircase, I sought the dormitory and reached my couch. I, I reached it, and once more drew a free inspiration. The next moment, I almost shrieked, almost, but not quite, thank heavens. Throughout the dormitory, throughout the house, there reigned at this hour the stillness of death. All slept, and in such hush it seemed that none dreamed. 
stretched on the nineteen beds, lay nineteen forms, at full length and motionless. On mine, the twentieth couch, nothing ought to have lain. I had left it void, and void should have found it. What, then, do I see between the half-drawn curtains? What dark usurping shape, supine, long, and strange? Is it a robber who has made his way through the open street door and lies there in wait? It looks very black. I think it looks not human. Can it be a wandering dog that has come in from the street and crept and nestled hither? Will it spring? Will it leap out if I approach? Approach I must. Courage! One step! My head reeled, for by the faint night lamp I saw stretched on my bed the old phantom, the nun. A cry at this moment might have ruined me. Be the spectacle what it might, I could afford neither consternation, scream, nor swoon. Besides, I was not overcome. Tempered by late incidents, my nerves disdained hysteria. Warm from illuminations and music and thronging thousands, thoroughly lashed up by a new scourge, I defied Spectra. In a moment, without exclamation, I had rushed on the haunted couch. Nothing leaped out or sprung or stirred. All the movement was mine. So was all the life, the reality, the substance, the force, as my instinct felt. I tore her up, the incubus. I held her on high, the goblin. I shook her loose, the mystery. And down she fell, down all round me, down in shreds and fragments, and I trode upon her. Here again, behold the branchless tree, the unstabled Rosinante, the film of cloud, the flicker of moonshine. The long nun proved a long bolster dressed in a long black stole, and artfully invested with a white veil. The garments, in very truth, strange as it may seem, were genuine nun's garments, and by some hand they had been disposed with a view to illusion. Whence came these vestments? Who contrived this artifice? These questions still remained. To the head bandage was penned a slip of paper. It bore in pencil these mocking words. The nun of the attic bequeaths to Lucy Snow her wardrobe. She will be seen in the Rue Fossette no more. And what and who was she that had haunted me? She I had actually seen three times. Not a woman of my acquaintance had the stature of that ghost. She was not of female height. Not to any man I knew could the machination, for a moment, be attributed. Still mystified beyond expression, but as thoroughly, as suddenly relieved from all sense of the spectral and unearthly, scorning also to wear out my brain with the fret of a trivial though insoluble riddle, I just bundled together stole, veil, and bandages, thrust them beneath my pillow, lay down, listened till I heard the wheels of Madame's home-returning fiacre, then turned, and worn out by many nights' vigils, conquered to, perhaps, by the now-reaching narcotic, I deeply slept. This is the end of Chapter 39, Old and New Acquaintance, read by Torah in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006.